Hey, Vinyl Community and others that might be watching, Elliot Cruz here with my trusty dog, Chester, uh, asleep on the couch. He'll probably get up and get a bone and start chewing on it any minute now. Uh, instead of doing a, a thread contribution or contest or showing the most recent records I got, I thought I would highlight an artist uh, in this video, and that, of course, is the great blues singer, Bessie Smith. Uh, who recorded from uh, the early 1920s to the early 1930s. Show you uh, five records that I, I recommend you consider picking up if you want to get into some of the great female blues singers from that era. Now, of course, you know, maybe my generation and later generations, we think of blues singers uh, Maybe it's the, the, the old Delta Blues singers in the 20s and 30s and 40s. and uh, Maybe others think of the electric blues out of Chicago but uh, that came in the 50s and 60s and beyond. But the most popular blues during its time in the 20s and 30s was the female blues singer. And usually these female blues singers... Uh, sang, went into the studio in New York or other locations and and recorded with uh, jazz musicians, small combos oftentimes. And uh, they would they would record uh, several sides for uh, you know for an artist, working with an artist. And of course Bessie Smith was the the most uh, prominent of all these that did that. Now in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, uh, one of the great, uh, great contributors of uh, pr the preservation of, of the blues and jazz and gospel, of course, was John Hammond. And he, along with Chris Albertson, came up with the concept of, of compiling all Bessie Smith's recordings and releasing it during that in. LP form, and there, Bessie Smith. Well, in 1921, she recorded a uh, some sides under a pseudonym, and uh, just uh, two sides. That's not here in this collection, and we also know she re recorded uh, a. a short, a Hollywood film short, St. Louis Blues, I believe it was, and she recorded that song and a couple of others on the flip side of the 78 uh, in, I think it was 1927 or 1929, something like that. Uh, that's not included here. But she made, other than those, those two exceptions I noted, she recorded 180 sides for Columbia, uh, for the race label under Columbia. And unfortunately, 20 of those were never released and they were lost. Uh, they deteriorated, the masters deteriorated uh, to the point they couldn't, you couldn't hear them, you couldn't use them, or they couldn't find the masters at all. Uh, so we're down to 160. So, uh, Starting in 1923 and going through 1933, Bessie Smith recorded these tracks. And interestingly, uh, in the early 1920s, they were acoustical recordings. They made the transition into electrical recordings. But so the sound quality of these first ones aren't quite as good. Now, I'm not going to give you a history of Bessie Smith. Uh, you can go to Wikipedia, you can read a book about the early blues or, or something like that to get that. Because I want to include some needle drops here, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that. But if you were to get this series of albums, you can, uh, you can purchase them uh, and read the liner notes, which gives you a really good, good history. But first, to get things, to get the ball rolling, here is... Betsy Smith, Bessie, I want to say Betsy, 
Bessie Smith and the first recording she made under her own name in 1923. idea that, that John Hammond and uh, Chris Albertson had was that we're going to take those 160 uh, uh, songs that we can, we're going to make them into 10 albums and we're going to put two albums uh, in each package thus this is the first one and it's called uh, The World's Greatest Blues Singer now the way they structured it in 1970 or so, this was 70, 71, 72, the way they structured it, people had console and suitcase record players for the most part back then and other than the real audio files. And these all came as changers. You could play a single record if you wanted to, but you could also stack the records. And I know I'm not telling a lot of you anything you didn't already know, but some people may not be aware of that. Uh, but if you've ever wondered why when you got a double or triple album, side the first record didn't have side one and two and the second one, side three and four, uh, this is why, because of the changers. So you on one record, you would have side one and four, and on the second record in the double record, you would have sides two and three. 
because when you stack it on the record changer, you get, it would automatically it would play the first record, and then when it was wrote, uh, through, tone arm would move back to, back out of the way, and the next record would pop down, which remember would be side two, and it would come over and it would play that one, uh, and then you just take the records off and you flip them over, and you've got sides three and four. That's that's why they do it that way, and you see old records. Uh, I think maybe in the late 1970s they most record labels quit doing that and you just had you know side one and two on the first record and three and four on the second but they put these together because of that concept the way they put these together is this first album that came out let me open it all the way up this first album has on the first record and there's nothing special about it. It's just a red, you know, it's not one eye or six eye or anything. It's just a red from the 1970s Columbia. Uh, you have, on the first record, side one, you have her earliest recording. And on the second record, side two, it moves in chronological order. So the first record on here... 1923 and then the the second record side two a little bit later in the 1924 25 something like that and then on sides three and four you don't have the next year's uh, recordings you have the last year's recordings 1929 30 and then she didn't record again until 33 so the first record has her very first recordings and her last ever recordings. And then you go, then they issue the second two record set. And this one is called uh, Bessie Smith's Any Woman's Blues. And side one and two on this one will pick up where side two left off in the first record, uh, moving chronologically, and then sides three and four are moving back, uh, back in time from the second most recent recordings of Bessie Smith. So that you get, if that makes any sense at all, so you get uh, not her latest recordings on the second album but uh, some of her later recordings in chronological order so what happens is as you go through the five albums uh, the first two sides of each album are moving this way and the, the uh, third and fourth side of each album is moving this way until when you get to the the last record they meet. Uh, the third record is Empty Bed Blues. There we go. And there, there she is. And the next record is The Empress. And the last record is Nobody's Blues But Mine. And it's a promo copy. So, if you purchase all five of these double records, you get everything Bessie Smith ever recorded. Now, as I mentioned, I believe I mentioned, the, the first recordings she made were acoustic recordings. The sound quality improves. So here is something from 1927. <laughs> 
They're getting worse every day. Lord, me and Josie's people, they're getting worse every day. Acting like a bunch of women, they just gabbing, gabbing, gabbing away. give you a long history of Bessie Smith, let you do that on your own. But like most artists, she had a, a she, she was hugely successful for a while. And uh, her first song that I played you a minute ago was a hit. Some said, I think it sold uh, three quarters of a million copies in 1923. Think about that, three quarters of a million. That's a lot of records. And uh, then the, the next recording uh, that, I, that I just played for you. Uh, she was still, you know, uh, she was a major star by this point. And I think she had her own railroad car, and so she rode to her engagements on her, in a railroad car rather than by car a lot of the time. But by the time, at 28, 29, economy's beginning to tank. We're getting into, beginning to get into the Great Depression, stock market, crashes in 29, the record industry crashed as well. In her strongest period, pre-depression, she could make, for to cut four sides, she would get paid $1,000. Which think about $1,000 in, say, 1925, 27, something like that. Made $1,000 for four sides. Uh, by the end of her career, if she could get fifty dollars a side, so two hundred dollars, uh, then that was, you know, that was that was pretty darn good at that point, because she wasn't in demand. Her music fell by uh, out of favor, and nobody could afford to buy records at that point, or not many people could. So records just weren't selling. Nineteen thirty-three, her career was was pretty much done for. She was singing in a gin mill in uh, in Philadelphia uh, as a hostess, singing in, uh, you know, baldy songs, pornographic songs, as they call them in here, pornographic songs for tips. 
Uh, and by this time, John Hammond, who put this, this series together, John Hammond uh, was organizing some, the recordings at that point, and he talked her into coming back in and talk the record company into recording her again, although they didn't think it was a, you know, it could be a moneymaker. I want to play you uh, from her last session ever in 1933. And this has got, and I'll, I'll list who's playing with her. It's got some, some uh, top uh, instrumentalists playing on, on this with her in 1933. <laughs> enjoyed that and I really liked that one. Uh, that was in 1933. I think by 37 she had passed away. She was dead. She lived hard. She drank hard. Uh, she was a rock and roll star before there was rock and roll, I guess you'd say. Lived that lifestyle and, and we lost her. But her music lives on at least 160 out of 180 of her recordings we can still have access to. So, a lot of people talk about this is an essential record. Ten records you've got to have or all that BS. Nothing is essential musically. What what you think everybody's got to have, 
I may think, why would I even want that? And, you know, vice versa. Uh, nothing's essential. Find stuff you enjoy and enjoy it. Pass it on to others. Say, look, try this out. And that's what I'm trying to do here. Give this a listen. You can pick up, uh, but it's not, it's not essential. Not essential. Uh, but it'd be, you might want to have some Bessie Smith. And if you do, this is what you need to look out for. These five recordings by Bessie Smith. Oop, turned around the wrong way. And if you, you pick one of them up and you've got samples of her music early in her career and late in her career. Pick them all up and you've got everything she ever did. And that's what I, I eventually did. I just gradually picked these. First, first I picked up a couple at record stores. I found one and I said, oh, and I found out it was a series. And then I picked up another. And uh, and then I ended up saying, well, I want all of these. And I ended up, the last two or three I got on Discogs. None of these records should cost you a lot of money. These, I paid like $6 plus shipping, $7, $8, something like that, plus shipping. Uh, when I got them from Discogs, and you know, at a record store, maybe I paid $10 for it, so eight, $10, something like that. You find it at a thrift store or in the wild somewhere or in a, you know, a state sale or something, you shouldn't have to pay more than a couple of bucks for it. But thank you, John Hammond and Chris Albertson for, uh, for compiling this. And if you want to know more about Bessie Smith, the liner notes in here are, are wonderful. They tell a lot of the story and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So that's a look at, at Bessie Smith. Check her out if you haven't already. And uh, I will well, remind everybody, you know, have fun. Be nice to each other. Don't be a butthole. Remember, we're all neighbors. Okay? Be kind to your neighbor. Take care.